All right, English teacher friends. So for this writing workshop, I want to exclusively focus on my template that uh, my students manipulate for their body paragraphs. So it's called the syllogistic method. So we're gonna practice writing syllogistic body paragraphs. My post that I made in the Facebook groups the other day and um, uh, on my YouTube channel about studying the poetry of hip hop and rap music really inspired this particular writing workshop. I entitle it Songs About Writing and Writers. So I'm doing this very early in the academic year. So I'm in upstate New York teaching AP Lit. I have Regents, AP Lang, Dual Enrollment, and then Credit Recovery. I have the whole gamut. So with this, I was I, I geared it particularly for my AP literature students because in terms of reading for like allusions and then theory and technique, I'm getting into deconstruction, new criticism, uh, a lot of those like feminist reads, psychological reads, things of that nature. Uh, I'm using songs with them. And I noticed there are a ton of songs about the craft of writing and writers themselves, which is a fantastic place to teach very close reading, especially for uh, poetry and prose. So that's what we're going to do for this. But I'm bypassing introductory paragraphs. Note that in my YouTube channel, there's a glut of... Uh, Writing, or, uh, writing workshops that go over my declarative and inverted uh, template for the introductory body paragraphs. So note that one of the things I always ask my teachers is this, what if we taught composition like Bob Ross teaches painting? So that's the title of my second textbook. And here's the kicker. When we teach like Bob Ross, we paint with our students. We literally get up to that easel and canvas and give them many exemplars and models. So everything that you see in these slides, I wrote for the benefit of my students and for you guys, for, uh, for teachers that watch this. And I really challenge teachers to position themselves as the expert writer in the classroom. It makes a world of difference. And I've worked with teachers for years. And one of the most terrifying things for some teachers is to show their writing to their students or they think it's like really laborious and time consuming. It's not like I was able to make this writing workshop in about 50 minutes. Right? I know these songs very well that I'm going to model uh, off of. So. It's just a matter of sitting down and writing it and busting out a template. So uh, that's the other thing. Bob Ross only ever used one template. He called it a heuristic called wet on wet technique. And every single time your students sit down to write a body paragraph, they can bust out the syllogistic method. So we're going to be performing literary analysis today, but it works for rhetorical analysis argument, persuasion, synthesis, and even longer research papers. So the first question we ask when we sit down to write an essay is, how do I write the introduction? As I've already mentioned, you can go on YouTube and check that out. I have like, I think I just eclipsed the 100 video mark. Uh, so you can you can easily scope those out. A uh, good place to start is with some of my poetry ones. So that you have that uh, hip hop and rap. Uh, there's one for uh, uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month. I just posted that. Um, and then just a wild gamut of uh, poetry videos on there. So just know that in terms of the introduction, you're going to ask yourselves two questions because it's implicit in the prompt. What is the authorial intent and how does the author construct meaning? Given that we're doing literary analysis, you're going to write three sentences to tackle this question. You always use the inverted thesis for uh, literary analysis. Three sentences, what is the authorial intent? Last sentence, how does the author construct meaning? So if you want to go that route and write your own for your kids, if you want to do the whole essay for this particular writing workshop, then that's my advice. And then just go check out some literary analysis videos that I have on my channel and you'll be able to do it. So real quick, you end with the thesis, context background, tier two level vocabulary. 
focus on rule number 18 from Strunk and White, Write It Right, the idea that there's 12 different ways to construct a single sentence, and an introductory paragraph is going to be four sentences long, no more, no less. So we're going to bypass that and go right to the body paragraphs. How do I write a body paragraph? You're going to proceed syllogistically every single time. So here it is, a brief overview of the syllogism. And I'm assuming people are familiar with my work at this stage of the game if you're tuning in. And if you're new to my templates, um, go into my YouTube channel and you can take a deeper dive into the history, the theory and technique behind the syllogistic method. I'm going to give a furtive, like cursory, perfunctory glance over um, for this writing workshop because I'm assuming that like, 98% of you have seen this before. So the syllogistic method is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. So Aristotle concocted this brainchild and he ran a school called the Lyceum and the rich aristocratic boys would go there to learn about polemics, oration, debate, wordsmithing, word wrangling. And as we see in some of the classic texts like Plato's Republic, they would throw out these real pithy, juicy questions like what is justice? And the great philosophical minds would step up to the mic and they would drop their definition of justice. And then the other students and philosophers would gather around and find all the bullet holes in that particular definition. What's unique about books like that um, is that each definition follows the syllogistic formula. So when you argue from premise, premise to conclusion. And Aristotle wanted his students to articulate their arguments in this very mathematic, computative formula in the hopes of achieving cogency. And that's just bulletproof logic, well-reasoned arguments. In composition, we often talk about line of reasoning. So I have my students write syllogistically to ensure that their line of reasoning stays intact from start to finish. So if I were to say premise one, arsenic is deadly. Premise two, my dog ate arsenic. I would conclude naturally that my dog is most likely going to die. Right. So it's just a matter of being logical, deductive, inductive reasoning. Be reasonable in your writing. One thing that students do, especially in literary analysis, and this is why when we read student papers, whether it's our own students or college board sample papers, we're like, man, that's so plot heavy. It reads like a cliff note summation. Most students in the nation are taught, they're instructed to start with the second premise. And that's what yields the plot. So we have to keep in mind, we're not writing plot analysis, we're writing literary analysis. So we gotta make sure we have that first premise in there. And I'll model that a few times for you. So the first premise for writing literary analysis is an argument anchored in literary terms and devices. So it's really important that you got the terms and devices in there. So the other thing is you're arguing literary analysis is an expository mode and all expository writing is an act of argumentation. So in FRQ1 for the AP Lang exam, the college board says, your argument must be central. And I say that to my lit students, your argument must be central. Second premise is textual support. And we have uh, a teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing. You don't want to do one more at the expense of the other. And then the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph, not the conclusion paragraph of the essay, but the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph are your echoes, links, and promises. So whatever you state here has to come back down here. It's like a handshake back to your brother. And then you've got to echo the prompt and echo the thesis. So this all takes about 10 to 12 sentences. Those little itty bitty four or five sentence bagger paragraphs that students write, there's not enough support or, or analysis in there to really say anything of substantive value. So I say 10 hard cap at 12 and that's what we'll do. So I am basing my analysis off of songs that students most likely would not choose. So I chose Billy Burroughs by, I think, one of the greatest singer-songwriters on the market right now, Jeffrey Martin. His lyrics are so intelligent. I love this guy. So what I can do 
for you if you're interested in these slides. So what I can do if you're interested in these slides is email you a list of songs that we compiled together. And uh, let me show you here, uh, right here on the screen. This is a list of a whole bunch of songs about writers and writing. So I'll just scroll and you can see. So I got a list of about 75 of these. And students know a lot of these singer songwriters. This is a great one, Oxford comma, explicit language. I was gonna use it for the purposes of this video by Vampire Weekend, but it does have some language in it. But great stuff in here. Everything from Fats Waller, Bruce Springsteen, The Decemberist, Simon and Garfunkel, Kate Bush, but you can research um, a whole bunch of, of these at will and, uh, and have at it. So I'm using Billy Burroughs by Jeffrey Martin. So the lyrics are here. You can uh, you know use those as reference for your students and unpack the diction. I'm a beat generation guy. So I grew up, bread and butter was Kerouac and Ginsburg and Bukowski. So those were the boys that really turned me into uh, a reader and a writer and a thinker and a speaker uh, love the beat generation. It really was the first spark to ignite my passion for all things being English teacher. Uh, so I, uh, I, I decided to go this route for my kids. So first premise is going to be three sentences long and students often ask, where do I begin? And I say, start where the author starts. So start where Jeffrey Martin starts. So these little uh, mentors clauses I call them right from the onset indicate to your reader that you have a chronology and a sequence and uh, again it's going to be three sentences long every first premise is three sentences long so in terms of how he constructs meaning how Jeffrey Martin constructs meaning what is he doing and that's the question you ultimately got to answer for literary analysis what is the authorial intent how does the author construct meaning? So look at how I do this. Right from the onset, Martin anecdotally details how Burroughs accidentally took the life of his wife, Joan Vollmer. So you can see here, drop the term. So anecdote, right? So it's a lang term, but we use it in lit too sometimes. The syntax not only captures the sheer tragedy of the event, but also reflects the songwriter's poignant reaction to having learned of the incident. Further, the standalone staccato clauses that end each verse heighten not only how this singer, the singular event dramatically altered Burroughs' life and career, but Martin's as well. So you can see there's a lot that's being promised in here. First premise is a promise. So we got to talk about that anecdotal narrative quality to it. We got to talk about the syntax, some of the overarching themes. We probably could get into conflict a little bit, right? So you just go in order. So what you talked about first here, second premise begins fourth sentence. Start with where you connected in the first sentence. One and four connect. Immediately, from a first person narrative point of view, Martin delineates that he remembers where he was when he first read Williams Bur William Burroughs shot his lover dead, put a highball glass on top of her head, and missed. Right. So one thing that I teach my students is this. I call it the five-word rule. If you place a, a minimum of five words, so a minimum, not exactly, a minimum of five words in front of a quote and keep the quote relatively small, it should sound conversational. I had to use a lot of brackets here, right, to keep it conversational so you could teach that. So we quoted, we got to analyze it. Clearly, this story left an indelible imprint on the songwriter's life. Ironic as it may seem, the accidental killing of Burroughs' wife is what launched Burroughs' writing career. And to the same effect, the story also spawned Martin's songwriting career. The telling of the tragedy, especially as Martin has written it, is like a gut punch. Just kind of matter-of-factly, Burroughs places a whiskey glass on his wife's head, a la William Tell, but in this case, he missed. The independent clause of and missed carries the weight of the first verse. So why did we bring that in? Because we were talking about the anecdotal narrative quality 
the second thing we talked about was the syntax so you just go in order right you go follow the keep the promise what you know drop a promise in that first premise and then the textual support all needs to connect for the line of reasoning to stay intact all right uh where was i um the independent clause of and miss carries the weight of the, of the first verse. Simply put, it's gasping and ineffably horrifying to lose a loved one in this manner. The conjunction of and to begin the second stanza is another tragic twist to suggest that life cruelly goes on in spite of the most horrifying of tragedies. <laughs> Martin acknowledges and identifies with the shock and horror Burroughs must have experienced in that he wonders if he knew it right then or if it took a while to sink in that he would never come back again not from this again that teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing we quote we analyze life forever changed in that split second of gunfire clearly burroughs never came back his life was forever altered and yet again the poignancy of the standalone standalone clause not from this is loaded all right, so why did we talk about all of this? Because we talked about the anecdote, the syntax, and those st staccato singular clauses at the end of the verse. We promised it, and we went in that order. All the quotes and paraphrases are germane to that promise, and that's how you keep your line of reasoning intact. In the end, we echo the prompt, echo the thesis, loop it all back. Martin deeply considers and reflects hard on what this actually means. This is life's cruel irony. This is how Burroughs became one of the saddest American literary figures. But this is also how Billy Burroughs became the face of one of America's greatest literary generations. So I went over here. I usually tell my kids cap it at 12. I went 15 sentences because I really wanted to demonstrate that five word rule for the quotes and that teeter totter balance. So I'm a little over, but it's not like egregiously over. Um, and again, I'm just modeling how to do it and how to how to sustain that line of reasoning. So that's one example of a syllogism. What do I do next? right and that's the exercise i just want my students practicing one syllogism that's it for this exercise i don't need a whole essay just practicing the template so what do i do next if i am to go on and write more about this if i were to do make this into a whole uh essay intro two bodies conclusion that's what my lit students do it's what my lang students do all frqs four paragraphs I'd bust out another syllogism. So since I'm the Bob Ross of composition, I got one more for you. I'm going to switch up my song, but do it the exact same way. You're getting a sense of my musical preferences here. There She Goes, My Beautiful World by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. So this is a song about what happens when the muse leaves us, leaves the songwriter, leaves the poet. So I know as a writer myself, I've published a lot of poetry, a couple of poetry collections, my textbooks. Sometimes the muse just ain't there. And sometimes like an existential crisis writers have is, oh my goodness, what if the muse is permanently left? Like you go three days without being able to produce a word and it stretches into a fourth and you're like, oh damn, maybe I wrote my last song ever. Maybe I'm a hack, a has-been, I'm done. So that just absolute dire crisis mode of damn, what if my career is done? That's what this song is all about. So again, first three sentences set up the uh, literary argument. So look at how this begins, right from the onset. Let's go back to Billy Burroughs, right from the onset. So my students are gonna steal that mentor clause to set up the chronology for the line of reasoning. Right from the onset, Nick Cave enumerates all of the natural forces that have prov that have provided him with the creative muse but as he knows this entity is elusive and fleeting muses are strange and the illusions cave makes to other artists reflects the fickle nature of inspiration what's the promise of the first premise so we're going to enumerate he has all these um nat nature metaphors in there that are stacked 
kind of you know, one of my students called it a litany and I was like, no, you kind of got to be grumbling and complaining for it to be a litany. So it's an enumerate, he enumerates, he gives, you know, like a delineation of all the natural forces in life that are metaphoric, that act as muses. So the trees, the airs, the fire, you know, the animals, um, you know, are, are all perceived as muses. And then the other thing we're going to look at is the conflict of the elusiveness the fleeting nature of the muse and then all the illusions so we're going to go in that order look at enumeration first the conflict or the theme of the piece and then the illusions so when we begin the second premise in the fourth sentence we should start with the enumeration because we set it first so look where we go immediately the songwriter provides a list of the many ways nature has sparked his creativity Everything from the wintergreen, the juniper, the cornflower, and the chicory. Do you notice we're doing the exact same thing that we did in the William Burroughs piece? So go back here. Uh, one more slide. Second premise, immediately from a first-person narrative point of view. So that's how the fourth sentence begins. Go back here. Immediately, the songwriter provides a list of the many ways nature has sparked his creativity. Everything from the wintergreen, the juniper, the cornflower, and the chicory. So a fourth sentence begin to paraphrase and quote. So when you quote, you got to analyze. Cave even goes so far as to personify his muse by stating that all the words his muse said to him still vibrate in the air. Artists often ascribe human characteristics to their muses, and some, as in the case of Cave, even go so far as deifying their mis these mysterious sources of creativity. But as any artist will attest, inspiration comes and goes rather at random. In Cave's case, he laments when inspiration flees, but is resigned in accepting that there she goes, his beautiful world. Yet again, Cave personifies his muse as a feminine force, but in this particular instance, he states that his muse is his entire world, and from a pragmatic sense, he's right. So why are we quoting this stuff? Like, why are we pay paraphrasing and quoting this stuff? Because you promised you would right here. The second thing you promised is coming in here. We have enough stuff to discuss the enumeration. Like, we, we, we hammered that. So now move on, right? go on so his music is not only his bread and butter but his life force and reason for being the refrain however highlights the cruel irony of muses and the artist relationship to her the biggest fear an artist has is that their muse will vanish forever and never return and we promised that we were going to talk about the conflict and the theme cave however in acknowledging this fear, assuages the emotion by realizing that muses come and go in sometimes the most bizarre of moments. In one of his many illusions, so why are we talking about illusions now? Because it was the third thing we talked about. And this is what I mean by um, uh, multitasking the first premise. If students don't write like this, then it's going to be one paragraph tone, one paragraph diction, one paragraph syntax, one paragraph illusion, one paragraph conflict, one paragraph theme. Holy methodic, you ain't getting no sophistication point doing that. That's for sure, right? And, and the paragraphs are going to be little itty bitty tiny things without a lot of support and dynamic quality to them. So it's really important that you multitask uh, for this. Uh, all right, so in one of his many illusions, Cave notes that John Wilmot penned his poetry riddled with the pox and that Johnny Thunders was half alive when he wrote Chinese rocks. All right, so we got everything. We're getting getting long here. We want to keep it to like 10, 12 sentences as an appropriate length for a body paragraph. So let's wrap this up. Even when one kicks and screams and begs and pleads, their muse is most likely not going to respond. This is the ultimate demise of the artist. While the likes of Cave and other artists plead for their muses to send that stuff down to me, muses don't work like that. They have minds of their own, minds totally independent of an artist's laments for more 
divine inspiration, right? So very good. And I went over here. This one's 13 sentences, totally fine, in the ballpark, in the range. But you can see here the line of reasoning is tight. It goes systematically, mathematically, computatively through it. And uh, that's how that's supposed to work. So note that if you like my stuff and uh, want to work more closely with me to learn some of the the methods and the magic of my madness i do offer something called the teach it right five-week mastermind it's a five-week course offered through the national writing project and this is how it works so during our five weeks together you'll see how the templates can be used uniformly across the expository modes of literary analysis rhetorical analysis, argument, persuasion, synthesis, and research. And in that, you get access to just a ton of my content. So I have writing workshops up the wazoo for uh, literature in particular, a ton of rhetorical analysis stuff, uh, interesting argument and synthesis projects so you get access to all of that my textbooks and uh, we also do a deep dive into my alternative grading methods and my plato's plato discussion modality and the next course begins september 25th uh 2022 and this is how it works even if you miss this one it's, it's how it's going to work so the class goes for five weeks we meet sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for an hour for five consecutive classes. Here's the ultimate kicker though. For those of you that need PD hours, the badge that National Writing Project awards is for 10 hours of completion. So five hours of contact time, you get a 10 hour completion badge. That's pretty cool. So uh, that's there. And so what we do is I teach for five weeks, take two weeks off, teach five weeks, take two weeks off. So we'll be running these throughout the academic year. So uh, no fear if you miss one. Uh, there'll always be one coming around the corner. I'm also in conversations with Perfection Learning to do some webinars with them over the course of the academic year and do some writing for them. So pay attention to that. And then this coming November, I'll be presenting at NCTE in Anaheim, California with my good buddies Brandon Abden and Tim Freitas. So uh, we'll keep you abreast of that. So note, I can be reached at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com should you want slides or materials or anything of that nature or have any general queries, um, questions about anything. And then more information about the mastermind and my other irons in the fire at my webpage, www.teachinghowtowrite.com. So that's it for now. Happy teaching, happy writing.